this stand, right? So what you are here for? Um, I'd love to understand a little bit of, of okay, so those of you who already work with machine learning algorithms or algorithms in general, can you please raise your hand? Okay. And, and how many of you are completely new to this area and are largely here to understand you know, what all the fuss is about? Okay. Um, so this is Nishant, largely for your <laughs> benefit. So you get a sense for where everybody is. Um, okay, so I'll, you know, without further ado, we'll, we'll hand it over to Nishant. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming uh, I know you have a little bit of a brief introduction to yourself, but but just to give you context, uh, Nishant uh, uh, is in has been in this area for for quite a while, um, and uh, you know started out I guess with got his MS and PhD from Carnegie Mellon University in computer science, worked at NEC Research in the US, worked at IBM Research, I guess, in the US and in India, um, and has since um, ventured out on his own. Uh, he'll tell you a little bit more about what he does, but uh, please join me in welcoming Nishant. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Vadi. So uh, let me just, so a lot of people said they are uh, new to ML and so what do you do? I mean, some sort of survey and they want to know what you do. Are you developers? Are you pro product managers? Are you, well, are you starting your own company? Okay, maybe developers. How many of us are developers here? Okay. Uh, product management. Uh, okay. uh, so I'm trying to understand what background that non computer science background. Okay. Okay. So is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, so this talk is going to be about. Uh, one form of artificial intelligence, and I might try to cover a, a very broad ground from the history to the modern neural networks and how they're used in practice and what, why, where we are going and why, what all the fuss is all about. Uh, so, a new kind of programming. Uh, some of you might find this topic a bit strange. Uh, so, so what this maybe uh, again. What does artificial intelligence mean to you? Okay, if if some of you could maybe just you know one line, two line, what, what does it mean to you? Yeah. So uh, we try to um, teach the machines basically uh, with algorithms. We feed some algorithms and then machines get their own uh, thinking power. Right. Two so way. okay, that's one more when you say thinking power, you sort of are humanizing the machine? Okay. Are you trying to make the human uh, the machine work like a human? And these algorithms are somehow, magic. and there's also a magic element to what you say, which I'll I'll try to you know bring it down. Uh, there's, there's a lot of so so the contrast to it is is that 
just like we have been programming, you know, we have this whole software engineering industry building these products, Java, Python, whatever web. This it is just another way of programming. It's very different from what we have been doing, but it, it's it's just another way of programming. Any other interpretations of AI? Anything? What what system are you giving? Her? Like we set up some rules uh -huh. how to think. So we are implementing in complaints into the artificial complaints. Or complaints. Of software. Some regulatory systems. Yeah. So so maybe I'll just pick up the word rules from what you said. So one way to make the machine sound intelligent is to write a lot of rules what are called expert systems. And we have been building these expert systems for a long time, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, the, the nature, the flavor of them has changed across time. But the, the problem with rules is that we have to hand code them. We have to think about all the possibilities and manually code them in, in a particular language that we know. And uh, we as humans, we have realized, and I'm going to cover this, we, we have realized that there are some rules that are very hard to get right. Like if you want to process images and you want to figure out what is the object in the image, people have been trying to write those rules for 30, 40 years, and they didn't get it right until, or almost right until you know five years, six years back. Similarly with text, understanding text or speech to text. When you are understanding, trying to analyze more sort of natural data, it has people have realized that it's better to let machine decide the rules when humans just supervise it, as opposed to trying to write the rules yourself. Okay, so, so just throughout things, and we'll be talking about these uh, the same themes multiple times. Okay, my background, I B-Tech uh, Kharagpur, I did my PhD about 10 years back, and I worked for IBM Research, Watson Group also for some time. Um, yeah, I'm a researcher and a consultant. I, I work mostly in the area of deep learning application of text, vision, speech, and real-time data. Yeah, uh, focus is mainly on building neural network and advising people how to, you know, if you're trying to build AI products, how do you go about it? But I'm, I'm, I'm more of a hacker by you know, English. Okay, so, yeah, so this is the outline. Uh, so I'll, I'll keep one of the themes of this talk is going to be pro a new kind of programming also software 2.0 okay. there's a little bit of eco yeah so how many of you have heard software 2.0 okay uh, that's fine completely fine it, it's a relatively new term and it's again a simplification uh soft but but it's meant to you know software 1.0 is what we have been writing uh, we have been writing rules by hand that's essentially software. And we have a whole industry of software engineering and practices of waterfall model and design model to do software 1.0. Software 2.0 is essentially you know, generalized machine learning, if you know what machine learning is. It's learning from data, learning rules from data. And, and, and calling it software, so it's, it's not just machine learning, uh, it's more than that. And I'll try to make it clear. Like Okay. Uh, talked about some history, uh, what are the recent successes, some stuff about businesses, how do you build a, or what are the perspectives to building the AI driven business, some more software to control and yeah, what what are the new problems that you have never seen in software or product that come Okay, so this is a slide that speaks what I've been saying till now. Uh, in 1.0, well, what's the starting point? We have data structures, we have undergraduate courses which teach you data structures, and programs are just transformations of data structures. You start with some uh, maybe hash table, fill it up with data, look it up, you know, do stuff like that. Build web applications which are again rules, uh, build infrastructure software, or AWS kind of Docker. They're all rules which transform data structures. Data structures. Basically, this 
dictionary sets and the core data types are integers and strings. In the 2.0 world, and I am sorry if it sounds very different even to the machine learning folks who know machine learning, I hope, I hope you can very quickly connect to what I'm saying. So in 2.0 world, the key data structures are vectors, a number, list of numbers, and then there are sets of vectors, matrices, matrices, sets of vectors, and there are sets of matrices, which are called tensors. And just like they as fundamental as data structure, you don't have explicit dictionaries here. You just have stacks of vectors here. And anything that you want to process, you first convert into a numeric vector form, then you transform. Okay. And so your program essentially is, is, is a bunch of vector transformation, tensor transformation. And this is the key differentiator. We were we most it's sort of control. We want to. We have an intuition of what output we want, and we write the rules by hand in 1.0. In 2.0, we have to sort of you know, keep a distance and let the set up the machine so that it can learn those rules. And all we do is to provide the examples. Okay. What does an example mean? It's the input and the output. Okay. So suppose you have an image and you want to figure out what object it has. It has a cat, dog, car, bicycle. So your input is an image, okay, and output is uh, a class, a category, okay. So it's, it's either cat or dog or car or whatever. Okay. So so when you want to learn this program, which transforms the image to one of the categories, you you transform the images into a vector format or matrix format or tensor format, and and then let the machine learn these transformations. You obviously provide some guidance, but learn these transformations that lets you get the output category, okay? And uh, the process of learning is there's a lot of theory and a systematic way of doing it. Uh, I I would call, uh, so, so I, I like to call the knobs. So it, it's a sort of a box inside which has those rules. And you can think of there, there are these calibration knobs like you have on a DVD player or whatever. And these are the parameters of the system for, for the machine learning folks. And when the machine learns from these examples to tweak these parameters and come up with the right parameters so that we can get the right output. Okay. Am I going too fast? Uh, this is what I'm saying comprehensible. Yeah. So I, and I'll, I'll give some more examples of what I'm trying. This is just a high level you know, view of it. And from what I have told you, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you who have been developing software or managing software are, have, uh, have this, this would be a little bit new to it. This, this way of thinking would be a little bit, even though if you have been doing machine learning. Okay, because essentially we are used to writing the rules ours. And now the focus shifts to setting up the data and setting up the, uh, the box of the template that, that is used to learn these rules, okay? And the other focus is on human-centric programs. So since the beginning of computing, people have tried to write programs which behave like humans, which can talk, speak, listen, uh, see like humans, and they have very successfully failed at it because one, one of the reasons is that we have been unsuccessful at writing these rules ourselves, okay? And software 2.0, one of the reasons why why this whole field or the alternate way of programming bloomed is we were suddenly very successful at writing programs, which we were not for a long time uh, using this different paradigm. Okay. Yeah. So quickly. So this is an example of. Why you would want to, you know, give up control on writing rules yourself and, and uh, let the machine figure out the rules. Okay, so any of you have tried to predict markets using mathematical methods uh, or cryptocurrencies or whatever? Yeah. So uh, if, if this is the chart, um, so one one feature on fact, uh, this thing called moving average simple moving average or exponential moving average that people have found very useful in, as, as a key feature in predicting. So, so if the turn is going to be 
is going downward. If you track the moving average, you will see that it starts going down right here. Okay, whereas the long term comes late. So it is sort of a very good indicator. So there are two kinds. So the sim simple moving average is just take the xt's are the points in time. No values open and close and Yeah, and take n past values divided by simple average. Okay. Uh, that, that's for simple moving average. That's for the the red curve here. And yeah. So the, the exponential moving average is a more complicated formula. It also weights all the endpoints in a different way. Okay. So here you you weight by one by n. Every point gets weighted one by n, and you get the output. It's a weighted average where every point's weighted one by n. Is that clear? With the exponential moving average, it, it's more complicated. It's multiplied by 1 minus a, where a is a factor. Okay. The, the point being that if you look closely, the EMA predicts the downturn much better or much earlier than SM. Okay. And EMA, SMA is, is something, a weighted average, something which is anyway very familiar to most of us. So, that might be the first thing that you would try, and that's a tool that you would come up very easy. EMA coming up, EMA might be harder. You know, it's not directly into you have to stare at this graph for a while and think why, uh, why you want to weight these things in a geometric way to to get this formula. Okay, and an EMA is also just like EMA is better than SMA. There's probably another moving average. Which is even better than EMA, which will help you predict the market even better. Okay, so there are two options now. Either you you wait for somebody to brainstorm and come up with that formula, and we can that wait can be pretty long. Okay, or you let the machine come up with that formula. So what is, both the formulas have are similar in the sense that they are weighted average. Compute the weights. Okay, so how instead of Instead of putting in the weights yourself, fixing the weights yourself, or setting up the formulas yourself, you can instead tell the neural network that these are my points, examples. These are my points where the downturn happened, the upturn happened, upturn, downturn. Okay, and you, you probably have to set up the examples in a proper way and all that. There, there's more detail to it. But if you do it properly, the machine will itself come up with a sort of weighting strategy. Okay, come up with these dynamic weights, which are, which could be even better than EMA, if, if you set the problem right. Okay, so that's the, that's the intuition. You can go on, keep on writing complicated rules, but if the pattern is way too complicated, either you need somebody very smart, or it's better to set up, switch to the software 2.0 mode, where you just set up the data, the input output data. In this case, the data could be, you know, all, all these points as the input and output being the downturn and upturn points. Okay. And the machine, let the machine set up the problem so that set up the box so that it figures out these weighted average points. Okay, this was a, a, a try to make make it somewhat concrete. What we mean by uh, building this? So, uh, am I in touch? Am I in touch with the audience? Is there somebody who I'm losing right now, and somebody could show it doesn't make sense? I have a question on the exponential moving average. Sure. So basically, when we do it, uh, like for example, if I am uh, reading the data points and I'm uh, trying to weigh each no node myself, mm -hmm. uh, and when the machine does it in a black box, uh, you know, sometimes I feel that the two, like for examples that I have picked and I have weighted the nodes and the that the one machine is uh, yeah. calibrating is a little different. Yes. In that case, uh, what is the best way to decide which is going better? Because most of the times the you know programmers are getting confused. Is our like our analysis better? Yes. So 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 our intuition versus what the machine is machine building. Is yes. One important element which I also miss is that there's also a since the box is black, yeah. if you can't see it too deeply yeah. Yeah. and the more complicated the network, if there's a neural network inside that box, uh, it's, it's very hard to figure out. They're just vectors of numbers, okay? And it's very hard to figure The interpretability we have lost in the 2.0 curve. So the fix there is to have a bunch of metrics. How, how close, uh, you know, some sort of sharp ratio or whatever, 
that that tells you on an average what is the score you are getting. And if it has come up with those rules right, it should maximize those metrics. Okay. So so your focus instead of struggling uh, to see a familiar rule from that black box, your focus switches to generating the right metrics. So if I generate the right profit loss formulas and the machine is actually maximizing, then it's doing the right thing. Yeah. And then there's a lot of detail in setting those right. So the focus shifts completely at the interface of the box, setting the input output and this supervision metric. Any other question? Okay, so I think I've been just repeating this off now. So, so this is the part where I just you know dump software 2.0 in front of you, and then we'll go back into the history of AI and how we reached here. Yeah, so yeah, pick a task T. This is general risk. Pick a task T with input I and output O. Input I could be images, output O could be the category to of the object in the image. Input I could be speech, output could be text, input I could be uh, a real time curve like stock market, output I could be, you know, where, where should I invest, where should I uh, pull back, where buy and sell. So, it's a very generic framework. Uh, and your focus is on setting up the input and output, right? Okay. And connect plenty of examples so that X is of input and Y is of type output. And then build a box with control Y. Again, I sort of seems very abstract when I read it. But essentially, you set up uh, a machine, uh, a, a parametric. Uh, well, and there are many ways to say it, and I'm trying to just uh, simplify it. Uh, you set up a what is called a parametric learner, uh, or in simple terms, a box where there are lots of knobs. And when you show these examples to that box, you will. Uh, it will learn to tune those knobs and come up with the right, uh, right value. Okay. So, and there's a, there's a there's a standard algorithm to do that. It depends on the type of the box also. Uh, yeah. Again, the learning process. You you is, because you have lots of examples x and y. You pick some x, pass it through the box, get some output y. If this output y is not matching the expected output. So what do you do? You take a diff of it, and the error is the diff with an expected and predicted output. You take that error and what is called back propagate it to the knobs in the, in the system. So you use those errors to actually tweak these knobs so that when the next time you pass x in, you get a better output or a y that is closer to the expected. Okay, that's the generic algorithm. And if it's guys you are familiar with machine learning, uh, you know, starting from logistic regression, linear regression, decision trees, random forest, and pick pick anything. All of these, all of those algorithms follow this same, including neural, neural networks, obviously. Okay, they're data driven, there are parameters inside, and based on examples, those parameters are tweaked. Okay. And the algorithm for tweaking the details of, might be different across these uh, you know, boxes, but uh, the, 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 the main ingenuity lies in setting up the examples properly and um, setting up the right diff function. Okay. So, so in fact, there are two things. One is the diff function and then there's a me measuring metric. There are two things, you know, more details. There. Okay, and, and you repeat this process of passing example, completing error, updating your knobs until that error is very small for the whole match. Okay. So, uh, so a neural network is an example of the box. What you do inside the box is sort of a template. So. Uh, the particular product problem this slide is talking about is you get an image which has a number, just one number, 0, 2, 9. Okay. The image of it is 7. And the output is the number 7 that you want to create. You have to understand that the image has 7. And, and this network is responsible for doing that. Okay. So, so this is an image which has 20 k across 28 pixels. Okay. So, 
you can imagine a vector that is uh, 20 kg across 20 to the 764 bits or dimensions long. That's what you feed it in. And what essentially goes on here is, like I told you, matrix transformation. That vector is transformed using matrix operations uh, to, to another vector space, and that is again transformed. So from here to here, one space, here to here, another space. Okay. And finally, what you get is one of these red things will be on, and the rest of them will be off. Okay. Again, I'm, I'm simplifying it. So transforming that image into this on-off format using a bunch of matrix multiplication. That's what goes on the side. Okay, how many of you are familiar with neural networks and some? <coughs> okay, that's what I did. What I explained matches your intuition. Something more you want? How will you come up with that number? Hundred neurons. How do you decide that? Right. Um, up front, it, it's an empirical process. Uh, what is called an hyperparameter to the, the box has a bunch of things. But I mean, in general, so that's part of uh, you know le learning curve software 2.0. When you look at a bunch of problems in this format and you build a number of neural networks, sort of so understanding this image is, is a very low complexity problem. That's why you know 100 neurons, even you don't need 100, 50 might be good. If you're trying to understand a sentence or you know speech. Things could go up to four thousand more. Yeah, but but it's empirical. I, I don't think anybody fully understands this theoretically. Yeah, I don't think your observation. What what is the process? Yes, and experiments. Experiments are again very key. I have one slide about experiments. Uh, yeah. So a more uh, dangerous looking diagram. Uh, it is the same network. Okay. There's an input layer. Now now I can introduce some terminology, but Again, if you're going to take the course, what you'll, you'll probably get into much more. Each of these bits are called neurons, and you know, you transform and there's you activate check if the neuron is activated by ch checking if the value is yeah, maybe jumping ahead. Yeah. So X's are my input neurons, which is the image. They're transformed into what is called a hidden layer, and then gets transformed to the output layer. Okay. Um, Mathematically, this is a vector. This is a vector. This is a vector. Vector is a list of numbers. Here, you just want a list of numbers where at least one value has a very high value, close to one. Others are close to zero. That's how you can say that this is the number that was state. Here, you have arbit number vectors with arbitrary integers. Okay. So, so and, uh, I'm not sure if some of you are finding this uh, too mathematical, or very just my style is. Is to present things in a more mathematical way, but uh, yeah, uh, please bear with me until I get out of it in a more, in a more stable thing. Uh, I think it's, it, it's easiest to understand these, or it's closest to reality to understand the working on neural network in terms of these vectors and matrix multiplication, other than any other abstraction, you know, you make a layer and a set of layers and Lego blocks or whatever. So, so, okay, so vectors does. And what transforms it here is a matrix. Here it's a W matrix, matrix called W. So, so these edges or neuron edges or what people call dendrites or whatever to you know, get derived inspiration from brain or how it, Originally, neural networks were derived uh, from uh, the formulas was derived based on. You know, people wanted to move the brain. Okay, but later on, uh, they figured out that these things work well by themselves. And you may, you need not. First of all, you don't understand how brain works. Second, you need not try to mimic it fully. Uh, it's, it's good to split them what they are, and they're good enough. Okay, so there are two way matrices W and U. And if you are ready to you know, deal with a little bit, X is transformed by W by matrix multiplication. You get this hidden edge, right? You compute this activation. It's a max. If H is zero more than H prime is more than zero, then you say it's one. Otherwise, you know, it's a zero. So only those vectors which are more than one here will sort of go forward or will be reflected in the latest. The others will be scrambled down. 
So transformation, activation. Another tra transformation is the new uh, edge it gets transformed to the output, output space. And again, I won't go into detail, but uh, this essentially ensures that the value of y is between 0 and 1. And one of them, you pick the one that is highest. OK? So again, how are we doing here? A more dangerous looking slide, even more. Yeah, so this goes to the, and if you know the softmax function, then there's an error. This is the diff function, which compares y and y. Again, don't worry about what this function means. It's cross entropy function. When you compute the predicted y, you have the actual y. So if you're taking the image of 7, you know the actual thing is 7. It compares 7 with the predicted output using this formula. Just the error, and then it back propagates. Now, where are the knobs here? I told you this box has to have knobs. Where are the knobs? This is the input, this is the output. Right. W and U, both of them. You can tweak these weights. You can think of, you know, for example, take this word, several edges incoming. It's a weighted, <coughs> weighted sum. The value here is a weighted sum of, of this. The weights are the edges here. That's a graph representation. Instead, you could think of matrix representation with edges. Okay, so essentially by learning, you, you tweak these weights so that the value here slightly changes. And so that in turn affects the value at one, one or several nodes. So that you get that. Okay, so these are the norms, the Ws. And typically, I'll show you the next. Yeah, so this is a, a real life neural network that is used to, uh, again, this is a few years old, 2014, that uh, was used to, as image classifier, given an image, find, and the output is about 100 categories, not, not just cat, cat, card, dog, it's, it's about 100 categories from a data set called image. <coughs> okay, so, so each, each W that I showed here is this, this box, and there's a whole series of Ws. Essentially, each W, <coughs> Converts the vector into a more a different space or an abstract representation, which is more useful in computing the output. And it turns out that if you have to do real things and analyze real images, you have to have a sequence of so many layers. Again, there are many patterns here. Just like the, you know, you write software and at one point of software, there are these uh, builder patterns, and there are interesting patterns of how you put together these knobs to compute the output. So that, that was just jumping ahead, but uh, I hope the importance of knobs and how do you get a, a big enough neural network architecture and why do you get that is clear. Okay, so I, I think this slide just stresses upon it. So in the one simple way is to, you know, you take the image seven and figure out every edge of it. Uh, okay, this is the corner, this is the straight line, this is another slanting line. And you give it as input to the box. And box predicts seven. Okay. That's the most basic of what machine learning started on. Okay. Or call it zero deep networks. In the subsequent stages, people realize that you don't need to compute all the edges and slant it and the corners to and feed it to the network. You can actually let the network compute some of them and just feed the minimal set of right inputs. Okay. So so you get sort of another layer of, of these norms on top of it. And what deep learning, uh, or the, the paradigm of what was called, in mean, deep learning as in terms of deep neural networks, it, uh, okay, uh, so, so, so what does deep learning essentially boils down to the fact that you provide a bunch of small number of features. In, 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 the, in the example that I just showed, the feature you just provided the image. You didn't compute anything on top of it manually by rules. Just provide the image, those pixels. Pixels are the lowest, uh, most raw level information. Okay, and you took that, take that was take that raw data and transforms it into uh, the output class. And how it does it? It computes several layers of features until it gets the output. Okay, this is one example of how you go about computing those several layers of each. Okay. 
and uh, yeah, that, so this graph starts from 2010. 2010, we are talking about the image classification problem, uh, which is the simplest one is you know, image with number, and we want number or, or complicated image with an object and one output the right object. Uh, so in 2010, basically the state was that people had written rules in computer vision for 30, 40 years. And uh, it's, it's around 27 or 25. That was the error. And that 25% of the cases, they were getting it wrong. Okay. And around 2012 was the first main deep neural, neural network, uh, or, or first significant uh, network made that point where the accuracy suddenly dropped. It was surprising for a huge number of people. People contested that, no, we can still write rules and, and not go into the 2.0 world. Okay. And because there the are hundreds of reasons. You know, managing stuff like this is, is new to almost everybody in this world right now. People are struggling and, and, and how do you manage these models? How do you retrain them? How do you set up the data? How do you, uh, yeah, how to clean up the data? That kind of stuff. People, machine learning people knew about it, but I don't think they knew it. Uh, they, they were ready to deal with it at, at the scale that it's happening right now. But the, the people who, I mean, many of the you know, uh, top researchers who switched around 2013 because they found that you can make even better networks that will capture the output better. You help you write better programs and, and you should stop writing rules. Rules in images, you know, you can think of computing the features or what I call it, histograms of pixels or you know the weight vectors of pixels. You can compute a lot of them. They're still very useful, they still perform well, but this paradigm is sort of you know way ahead. Um, so so this was a particular example on image classification which which brought about the transformation, which sort of led to the buzz that AI is back. Okay, and 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 there were several other domains where, where similar curves were found. You know, programs that were uh, had a huge error till, till recently, suddenly the curves became much smaller. Okay, so, okay, so now I'll you know, switch to the history of it. So I sort of told you where we are, uh, where the transformation of 1.0 to 2.0 happened. And now, one of the reasons why the buzz about AI is that people, a lot of people have started believing that you know, if you, write programs with examples and knobs, you can actually do well on a huge number of use cases and make big, big businesses around it. Okay, so uh, any questions at this point? Am I going too fast, too slow? <coughs> can I just let you questions. So, so I introduced software 2.0, told you, I showed you what basically the box looks like and very abstractly the algorithm that trains that box. Again, questions? Anything? So I understood what you mentioned about deep learning in general, mm -hmm. uh, but we started with the premise of how it would rather help for your software to go zero, right? This this place. So how does it even help you create better software? I'm still not clear about it. So we mentioned writing writing rules <coughs> by ourselves and then moving forward by not writing most of them. Let the machine write. Create the rules rather, but how does it come back and help you create better software? That's not the transition. Uh, maybe, yeah. So, one simplest deep learning is software 2.0. Does that no? So, better what does better mean is the question. So, this curve sort of tells you what is better. I'm thinking of in general, right? What else software we think about in general, any program, right? Uh, so, so one way is you embed AI into existing programs. Huh. What I'm trying to think here is, are you talking about 
writing programs from the scratch that have, have a very different, if you just write programs in a different way. What do you mean that how to apply software to dot code into software world dot code? I'm not sure that's simple, right? So writing software is, is one. Doing AIML is another. Uh, so, so I would contest that they are not different. <coughs> Sorry. No, what I mean is, uh, obviously, see, at the end of the day, you write rules and conditions, and you have inputs and set of outputs. Right? You know, so, so here, here you you don't have that. You don't use it then else state. You don't use file state. Yeah, yeah we're not even coming to that. So okay. What okay. I'm trying to say is a general programmer mm -hmm. or a web developer might not even think about AI at all. They're writing their program. That's yeah. right. Or the enterprise stack. That's right. There's a set of separate set of folks who do AI ML predictions and all the time. Mm -hmm. As of now, people are talking about embedding AI and ML capabilities into their application. So you have an okay. existing application that you try to Give certain capabilities to that application mm -hmm. to do AI and right. ML. So my question here is: when we say software 2.0, and then we say this is a new way of writing software, what is changing? Okay. Except for the machine writing. So what, like you said, there are two camps. What fundamentally changed? There's now a single camp which does both software 1.0 and 2.0. So software 1.0 is not going away. Okay, maybe that point was not case. 1.0 is still going to be, you're still going to write web applications in the way, maybe with better apps. But 2.0, the, the both will get combined in a very seamless way. Okay, but the problem is that people don't know how to write 2.0. This the software engineering discipline is not developed for you. I talk about some of the issues when you start writing the building example and dealing with data, which web developers are not at all familiar. And one of the, one of the hypothesis, one of the the desire, the goals of, this, of, of you know, communicating this perspective is that everybody become familiar with this 2.0 view. Both of them are going to exist. How they're going to interact is, is, is quite tricky and, uh, and it may not be, the whole system could be just 2.0 end to end. If there's a network and you, you, you need not write a single if then else inside the group. So again, uh, we will come back to that and maybe uh, longer discussions. So now I'm sort of going in the flashback mode and where, where we all started here. So the first, again, as I said, brain inspired computing is what the, uh, a lot of people try to think that we have these powerful objects called brains which, which are trying the whole humanity. Right? Why don't we simulate it with computers? If you're able to do that, we'll be, we'll be able to make vastly different and vastly efficient uh, computing systems. And uh, so I think the perceptron model is probably the first landmark in, uh, in brain inspired neural networks. And essentially it looks like, this, this is probably a diagram from one of the old papers, essentially it looks like uh, a weighted average, the same network that you should. You have the initial object or matrix uh, you transform it into this hidden layer, compute these activations. Activations were especially important in capturing the, the, how brains work because uh, if the potential of a particular whatever, axon or dendroid was more than something, it fires. They wanted to capture that. So so they have this this special activation node which is still there, the max function that I showed you, but it, 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 it's, it's not toned down. It's sort of part of the net. There's no explicitly you know, even if the, the value is less than zero, sometimes the value goes from. So, so we, okay, so, but the idea was that there are these input output neurons and a bunch of hidden layers and then transformations happen. Uh, so very soon uh, after, after Rosenblatt proposed this perceptron, number of people, may see number of <coughs> and, uh, yeah, so, so people started wondering that if, if we have created this small unit, which replicated will actually simulate the brain. Yeah, are we entering a sort of a new age, new world where you know these machines can take over? Them? So immediately, this sort of uh, hype, uh, you know, overcame or raced forward with the actual practice. And uh, some some influencers said, oh, "No, no, this is a very simple unit. You can't even run the XOR function. No, big Y is XOR." And 
that you know suddenly put the speculators down and then and, and that's one instance and that has happened repeatedly in the history of AI. So every time people started making brain uh, inspired mechanical things or computing uh, units, but but where the technology was versus where the hype was, the hype all, always was way ahead. And people started <laughs> investing and, and dreaming and writing articles and, and journalists, media, whatever. And eventually it turned out that, oh, my function can't even add. Everybody, you know, you know, pulls back the money, in. and it, so this has happened a number of times in the past. This was where around the perceptron, uh, then the Minsky's paper, and these are called the AI winters. Again, this, yeah. So the optimism goes up, the winters go down. Winters, strong lack of funding, people who have, you know, devoted their sort of. You know, entire tenured lives pursuing this suddenly have no funds to you know, fund the graduate student, that kind of stuff. So it went down again, again hope, again went down. Every time there was a different reason. Okay, so again this is same. So I'll talk about one or two intermediate stages also on the next slide, but we are here. At this point, we have three days to go. And uh, I, I believe most of you have read these articles where, you know, this Facebook bot you know, took over their creators and started chattering on themselves and all, all sorts of stuff. You might have also heard about how uh, the Google DeepMind's um, AlphaGo, uh, essentially a set of neural networks, actually bet the, you know, the most smartest Go player in the whole world. Uh, in, a, in an open competition, so so uh, it, it's very difficult to you know it's a very thin line between the hype and where the actual technology is, and only by deeper understanding and being careful, we will we'll be able to figure out where. I don't think anybody knows where we are going. There's there's a lot of hope that we'll uh, we'll not go into any air winter. Uh, we will uh, actually the the, the technology we, we have. The number of use cases where technology is sufficiently ahead of what it was in the past, what would be, it would be worse without this 2.0 thing. And so we'll definitely keep on doing those and all the big companies are investing in that. But whether we'll have what we call artificial general intelligence or not, people keep speculating, but uh, in my opinion, it's not worth speculating that level. So, yeah, so you know, even in 60s and 70s, you could find articles where people say, yeah, small children pain, like, oh, it's a simple person problem, which can't even itself, okay? And, and, and people uh, wrote articles like this. Uh, you, you might have a, a Stephen Hawking in the last few years, I think, made a comment like this also. Coming from such geniuses or so-called geniuses, it's really, I mean, hard for other people to figure out which way they are going. But when you look at the technology and how it's going, it tells you a different story. So, so even though we have these crests and trials, uh, we, we keep the, the, the current system, the huge network that I showed you was not a result of one day research. It was this whole series of, of events that happened. So in the 80s, what somebody we call rule-based, very complicated knowledge-based rules working on knowledge -based. Many such systems were very popular used in insurance companies and all that. that. The first self-driving vehicle was, I've heard about that a number of times now. It's actually made in the 80s by some well uh, very simplistic one, but prototype was there. In 90s, his uh, prof at, earlier at NYU, now he's leading the uh, Facebook AI research. He He's sort of responsible for popularizing what are called convolutional nets. The, the, the diagrams are shown, every layer was a convolutional layer. And, and the applications were very simple, unfortunately, then, because of number of reasons. Can writing recognition or, or speech token, you could only get keywords of speech, not the whole speech. And uh, even that was very useful for many use cases. At least it was a big jump from what it was. Really. And this whole dream of AI was actually coming to reality in these small ways. So these guys have been persistently, in spite of the winters, working uh, through the process of trying to slowly improve it because of the intuitions. Uh, the rest of the world, I think, has been just sitting and watching. 
Okay, so I am not sure whether to talk, but the learning algorithm that I uh, talked about. So all of this, maybe, yeah, around 84, this is where, so perceptron as such was invented in 60s, the basic block of the neural net, but the, the, the generic learning algorithm called backpropagation uh, came in around 86. Uh, uh, the first version, I think, was. So I think the idea, now, now again, switching back to the math mode very quickly, um, you have this, this function, okay? Now, the, the diagram of the neural network that I showed you was essentially, I mean, you could, you could write this function in terms of a, a neural network where, you know, you could take A and B, transform it, get X, take B and C, transform it, get Y, and then take a product of X and Y, transform it. All of these, if X and Y are vectors, you can write them in, in that same form. So, okay, so just trying to connect you to this thing. So if we have a, you know, sort of a neural network like this, and at the end, I told you, you compute the error quite different. Uh, that error is back propagated to the holes here. Suppose D is the hole uh, or the knob uh, that has to be tweaked. So uh, the, the, the key idea behind the back propagation right, is, is the chain rule in calculus. If you have a continuous function, like, okay, I'm drawing with my hand here, you know, this one, and you're here, the bottom is here, and you want to get to the bottom, you can compute the gradient at every point and get to the bottom, okay, and in an iterative way. That's essentially the, the back propagation algorithm. When when you have a single variable x, and like instead of image being 28 cross 24, 28 variables, you have a single variable x, you can think of this curve and think of the gradient that brings you down here. When, when it's more complicated, you have a more complicated algorithm, which essentially, in principle, does compute the gradients in a high High dimensional space so that it comes to the point of minima or the, the best point where the points where the <coughs> these knobs have the best value best in the sense they compute the right output okay and uh, you, you it's extremely useful and important to understand these algorithms at, at the core but now there are several packages tensorflow pytorch almost all of them which have the this as the fundamental block and you can build software on top of it. So, so if you were to start start building neural networks from this, at this level, nobody would be able to bring practical systems, which is what was happening in, in the 80s and you know, definitely in the 60s. Now, this whole layer of stack that is developed on top of this that can help you work at the use case level and not, not be too bothered. About it. Still have to worry, but not be too bothered. Okay, so now coming back to the current, uh, like I told you, around the image net example was around 2012. Uh, the changes started happening around 20, 2008, 2008. And, and as opposed to the previous AI winters, the, there are broadly four things that changed. Okay, we had very mature software 2.1.0, from web development to infrastructure to matrix multiplication libraries whole stuff was pretty robust. A lot of people were using it for their own use case. Okay. Data storage, big data, the, the phenomenon of big data, I think early 2000s, and the massive Hadoop implementation, people knew how to do stuff at scale across you know, clusters of computers in the cloud. And, and another very interesting thing happened, which was also responsible for the work. Typically, the research and production or maybe business, were very, very far apart in the past, even in other contemporary computer science fields. So, so there's a research paper, which, so the original map, uh, how many people are familiar with map reduce? Okay, some of them, there is the core algorithm behind uh, you know, distributed parallel computation. The original map reduce paper was in 2004. People in Google, some very agile ones, actually made the system work. And slowly, you know, Yahoo, and then it got open source, Hadoop, and Hive, and all of that. So, so the, the gap between the original paper or the few set of papers and using it in production was maybe ten years. For for some reason, the the, the leaders, some of them, the pictures are here, made sure, or the students made sure that as they learned, 
they also, so if they wrote a paper, they wrote a blog about it. They put out the code and answered questions. This, this was a very unique phenomenon. I've been doing research for more than 15, 20 years. But before this, I had never seen this kind of people. Researchers were generally shy to let out their code because they'll find bugs and that will you know, hamper their you know, progress or they won't be write the, able to write the next paper. And whereas in this case, uh, people, so, so this guy is, is the, he's the, he's the maybe the most youngest one, Andre Karpati, who is now the director of the staff, you know. Yeah, he, he, as he was doing his PhD, he, every paper he wrote, he explained that stuff. He, his, 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 his courses were all open and anybody in the world could learn. And people were screaming on Twitter, thank you for the course, thank you for it. And so all, all those guys, this is Jan Lukin, this is Jeff Hinton. He's probably the most stubborn of all and most visionary of all. This guy is Coursera's head. And, and he was by doing, and many of many swear by his machine learning code before this this you know, or deep learning phenomenon happened. So these leaders have been very open and very insistent on, on, on making people understand and adopt the technologies as they are going. And that's one of the reasons we are suddenly in a completely new style of programming and people are unfamiliar, but, but you know, still trying to, to learn as fast as they can. Okay. Yeah, so I have a video here, but I'm not sure. Uh, it, it can is, is video playable here? It will take about seven minutes. Huh? Uh, how are we doing on time? What is the? Yeah. 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 So I have maybe 10, 15 slides up to this. Just click on that video. Yes. Yeah. Just this is a sort of funny video. He's called yes. the book. It's Jeff Hinton. Because of a back condition, he hasn't been able to sit down for more than 12 years. I hate standing. I'm not sure I'll sit down, but if I sit down, I have a distance. Sorry. Well, at least now standing desks are fashionable. And yeah, but I was, I, I was standing when I was standing when they went high. Since he can't sit in a car or on a bus, Hinton walks everywhere. The walk says a lot about Hinton and his resolve. For nearly 40 years, Hinton has been trying to get computers to learn like people do. A quest almost everyone thought was crazy, or at least hopeless, right up until the moment it revolutionized the field. Google thinks this is the future of the company, Amazon thinks it's the future of the company, Apple thinks it's the future of the company, my own department thinks this stuff's probably nonsense and we shouldn't be doing it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I took everybody into it except my own department. <laughs> You obviously grew up in the, the UK and you had this very prestigious family full of, of famous mathematicians and economists. And I was, you know, I was curious what it was like for you. Yeah, there was a lot of pressure. Um, I think by the time I was about seven, I realized I was going to have to get a PhD. Um, <laughs> Did you rebel against that or you? you I dropped out every so often. Yeah, I became a carpenter for a while. Jeff Hinton pretty early on became obsessed with this idea of figuring out how the mind works. He started off getting into physiology, the anatomy of how the brain works, then he got into psychology, and then finally he settled on more of a computer science approach to modeling the brain and got into artificial intelligence. My feeling is, if you want to understand a really complicated device, like a brain, you should build one. I mean, you could look at cars and you could think you could understand cars, but when you try and build a car, you suddenly discover, well, there's this stuff that has to go under the hood, otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> As Jeff was starting to think about these ideas, he got inspired by some AI researchers across the pond. Specifically this guy, Frank Rosenblatt. Rosenblatt. Um, in the late 1950s, developed what he called a perceptron, and it was a neural network. 
a computing system that would mimic the brain. The basic idea is a collection of small units called neurons. These are little computing units, but they're actually modeled on the way that the human brain does its computation. They take incoming data like we do from our senses and they actually learn, so the neural net can learn to make decisions over time. Rosenblatt's hope was that you could feed a neural network a bunch of data, like pictures of men and women, and it would eventually learn how to tell them apart, just like humans do. There was just one problem. It didn't work very well. Rosenblatt, his neural network was a single layer of neurons, and it was limited in what it could do, extremely limited. And a colleague of his wrote a book in the late 60s that showed these limitations. And it kind of put the whole area of research into a deep freeze for a good 10 years. No one wanted to work in this area. They were sure it would never work. Well, almost no one. It was just obvious to me that it was the right way to go. The brain's a big neural network, and so it has to be that stuff like this can work, because it works in our brains. There's just never any doubt about that. Now, what do you think it was inside of you that kept you wanting to pursue this when everyone else was giving up, just that you thought it was the right direction to go? As if everyone else was wrong. Okay. <laughs> Hinton decides he's got an idea of how these neural nets might work, and he is going to pursue it no matter what. For a little while, he's bouncing around research institutions in the U.S. He kind of gets fed up that most of them are funded by the Defense Department, and he starts looking for somewhere else he can go. I didn't want to take Defense Department money. I sort of didn't like the idea that this stuff was going to be used for purposes that I didn't think were good. He suddenly hears that Canada might be interested in funding artificial intelligence. And that was very attractive. But I could go off to this civilized town and just get on with it. So I came to the University of Toronto. And then in the mid-80s, we discovered how to make more complicated neural nets so they could solve those problems that the simple ones couldn't solve. And his collaborators developed a multi-layer neural network, a deep neural network. And this started to work in a lot of ways. Using a neural network, a guy named Dean Pomerlu built a self-driving car in the late 80s, and it drove on public roads. Jan LeCun in the 90s built a system that could recognize handwritten digits, and this ended up being used commercially. But again, they hit a ceiling. It didn't work quite well enough, because we didn't have enough data, we didn't have enough compute power, and people in... AI and computer science have decided neural networks for wishful thinking, basically. So it was a big disappointment. Through the 90s, into the 2000s, Jeff was one of only a handful of people on the planet who were still pursuing this technology. He would show up at academic conferences and be banished to the back rooms. He was treated as really like a pariah. Was there like a time when you thought this just wasn't going to work and, and you, you no. have some self doubt? I mean, I, there were many times when I thought, I'm not going to make this work. <laughs> but Jack was consumed by this, it couldn't stop. He just kept pursuing the idea that computers could learn until about 2006 when the world catches up to Hinton's ideas. <laughs> Computers are now a lot faster. And now it's behaving like I thought it would behave in the mid ages. It's solving everything. The arrival of super fast chips and the massive amounts of data produced on the internet gave Hinton's algorithms the magical boost. Suddenly, computers could identify what was in an image. Then, they could recognize speech and translate from one language to another. By 2012, words like neural nets and machine learning were popping up on the front page of the New York Times. You have to go all these years and then all of a sudden, you know, in the span of a few months, it yeah. takes off and it finally feel like, aha, you know, the world has finally come to my vision. 
There's some real relief that people finally came to their senses. <laughs> For Hinton, this was clearly a redemptive moment after decades of toil. And for Canada, it meant something even bigger. Hinton and his students put the country on the map as an AI superpower, something no one and no computer could ever have predicted. Thanks for watching, and if you want to see more Hello World, click on the link to subscribe. Yeah, I hope that video was interesting and useful. It just told you the human angle of the whole story, and this guy has been at the forefront. There were many of his peers who, who dropped out or lost out, but this guy sort of stayed from. He is one of the co-authors of the original, or one of the key versions of the back propagation of the 86, and you know his latest latest paper came out last year called Capsules, which again I mean, he has he he's been trying to make his intuitions about how brain works, uh, you know, trying to implement them in, in computing, in, in hardware, in computational terms, and you know the the current neural network as we know it and this uh, is just one instance. Of this this probably much more detail that he has his intuition or maybe his students have his intuition that we we'll see in the next few years, which could be maybe more efficient in learning and you know, maybe much smaller than what we have, maybe there will be less data. But anyway, this, this was the, the human angle of the, the whole story of about AI winters. Okay, so coming now, whether this is true or not. <coughs> okay, so now, now I'll just write the curve of, of the buzz from 2010. IBM, this IBM Watson, uh, a computing system, played Jeopardy and bet the top Jeopardy players. So Jeopardy is a question answer game. You actually are given the answer and you're supposed to count the question. It's very, very popular in, in the US and Western world. And it's kind of a very hard event for human beings. And, in the, the grandmaster that involved analyzing a huge amount of corpus wikipedia and blah blah and doing reasoning over it to figure out what is this answer which event does it right and so a number of events happened around the same beginning 2010s which you know added fuel to the fire it was done it. so deep mind google deep mind is a company that google bought a bunch of researchers but the topmost Go player. Go is a far more complicated game than chess. So Deep Blue in 97 bet Casper, that was considered a great AI moment, but compared to what this system looked like, Deep Blue was a very interesting system. Yeah, and this was a huge A lot of this played out in the open. So they they, they bet the initial level Go players, then the harder ones, and the other, and eventually this championship. And and plus they wrote papers about it, how exactly those systems are, so that there's no you know, magic, or at least to uh, glean away the magic from it. This is happening right now. Okay, I'm not sure. So Dota is a, is a very popular game, uh, multiplayer uh, cluster-based game, where, you know, if you have played any of these games, uh, you have to strategize, cooperate with your, your buddies, and get this object, go there, collect nomination, blah, blah. Okay. And, and what is happening right now is the institution called OpenAI, where the researchers have built a system which can actually beat reasonable, I think, 99 percentile players. Now, now this, this is far bigger achievement than just playing. Now, it might seem a bit silly why we are trying to you know, praise these researchers who, who are trying to build these, these uh, computing systems which can uh, play these games and, and beat those. The, the thing is that there, uh, it is definitely a competitive sport, and it involves understanding images, uh, understanding maybe language part of it, uh, planning, strategizing, and cooperating with other agents. So th th these are like four or five things that human beings do, and then you know they need to learn to do these things, uh, which the computing system can automatically do. Okay, which is a reasonable feat. Now, now, winning in a Dota game may not be very useful for the rest of the world, but 
the, the elements that you learn of planning, of understanding images, cooperating with agents, they, they have n number of applications in, in you know, operations, scheduling, planning transport, n number of them. Okay, and, and so again, the, 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 the networks that they use are open and you can go and read about them, understand how they tweak them. They're very open with this. And like I said, it's a very democratic kind of knowledge sharing system that is actually pushing up the 2.0 paradigm. Self-driving cars, I guess everybody has been hearing and debating about things won't work in India and blah, blah. Yeah, but yeah. So originals cars were, I think the first one was built in early 90s. But it requires lots of data training to, to get working in, in all sorts of traffic conditions. And uh, yeah, so there are a bunch of, it's driven by these cameras or leaders, which feeds into a convolution network and then determines where you steer and how you steer. And it needs to know where the objects are, you know, where the cars are, where the human beings are, when to stop and makes those judgment based on their courses which teach you specifically. Okay, and, and those were the sort of standing out. There are numerous small, small developments. One in particular, medicine. Now, FD, the Federal uh, Drug Control Authority, yeah, in, in the US that controls, monitors what drugs are out, registered, you know, an AI or a thing that can understand your lung images, can figure out uh, by looking at lung images whether you have pneumonia or not. Okay, or this cancer, lung cancer or not. Uh, FDA resisted for a long time letting out these things. There's a lot of fear among doctors plus efficiency of but slowly, I think last year, I think the first uh, AI powered uh, diagnostic system was out. The, the main idea that the, these are these are automated units that will help doctors do their job better. Okay, Google uh, duplex, I guess you might have seen um, this demo from Sundar Pichai. I mean, a lot of people are wondering whether it's real or not. The assistant actually makes a call to the hairdresser and, and books the thing. I and mean, the, the call seems like very natural. I mean, you can't, people are saying that you need to tell the person that I'm a robot. So, again, this thing has developed upon lots of research on natural language understanding and speech understanding. And, Text to speech, speech to text. Uh, it all combined together comes out. Alexa is now in India. Uh, it, it's a so Amazon has interestingly found this business model where they can take this. People don't want to go to the computer, right? They just want to talk. It's probably the first uh, you know, widely or slowly getting popular model of of people conversing with these automated boards. So a huge, so from 2010s, there has been a huge, in terms of research, building these complicated uh, autonomous systems and the use cases application business model. Uh, the, the talent is scarce. People who know how to programs of 2.0 well is scarce. Uh, a lot of people are just stuck inside well-paying big companies, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, but the rest of the world is Know, catching up and, and there's a huge, huge amount of interest in learning. Okay, now now coming back to I mean hype versus reality. Artificial general intelligence, where the machine behaves very similar to human, involves a number of tasks. Like I said, for Dota 5, there are four or five tasks that involve. There are n number of tasks that involve. Most importantly, reasoning and abstraction. So the current systems can't do reasoning and abstraction. Very, very rudimentary forms of it. So, so we are still very far away. At least a lot of people, including me, believe that. But there are a bunch of human centric tasks, like the ones that I described. You know, you're looking at the image and finding out whether there's a nodule in the lung or not. Many times the machine can do better than you. And maybe one should let the machine do it with, with human beings' cooperation or uh, supervision. So, we are, and, and there are n number of businesses that are going to be affected and, and benefit by using the technology. And this is a tweet from today's uh, Andrew. So I guess people keep going back. They see a hyped article in New York Times, and these researchers try to mellow things down. And 
Um, so, so too optimistic is AGI. Deep learning will let you do AGI. I don't think anybody agrees. Too pessimistic, DL doesn't do anything. You just stay in the 1.0 world. Uh, and then there's an AI winter coming. That's also. So middle ground is probably the right perspective to keep. That it can't do everything, but it will impact countless lives and business. Okay. So, so that's the history and the hype and the buzz. Okay. Now I'll quickly just talk about some aspects of the business. Uh, Sundar Pichai's quote: "AI is probably the most important thing humanity ever worked on. I'm doing calls today as the new electricity." I mean, sometimes these guys are themselves responsible for the, the hype. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. but we'll be seeing applications, all of these, and, and maybe more businesses. Uh, yeah, I mean, these are just charts if you like looking at uh, so many acquisitions, right from 13 to uh, the many companies, uh, MetaMind. Uh, many companies started by researchers who know this thing well and getting bought by the Google uh, and Facebook, that kind of paradigm. Microsoft bought a bunch of them and uh, I think it keeps buying many of them. Yeah. So, I mean, from the point of view, building a business, you can build a business which can be bought by one of the stalwarts. Uh, and that's, that's one of the business models that people pursue. Yeah, this is just a uh, uh, what, what people perceive, the perception <coughs> in terms of which industry is going to benefit when. So uh, maybe telecom and, and consumer space are getting. So e-commerce, you know, search on, on web pages, recommendations. All these systems have been there for a while. <coughs> the efficiency improved, has radically improved over the last few years. And thanks to these technology. Okay. Yeah, why would you adopt AI? Yeah. I mean, uh, there are many reasons why people are reticent or hesitant about adopting this, this this scarcity of talent. There's not enough belief. There's AI winter coming. All sorts of uh, plus there's hype, which suddenly tells you that it's going going through the roof one day. And so so people are hesitant, but you know I, I think they're just following the the bigger players. And once they let out technology, everybody tries to make you know chatbots or something. Yeah, so if I try to recall, uh, uh, yeah, the chatbots, the hype around chatbots went up. At the, uh, you'll stop typing, you'll just you know, have automated agents. Uh, you, you'll not have manual agents in customer centers, you just start talking to them. The, the vision took a number of years to realize. And now there are more you know, stable businesses doing that. Similarly, around medicine, uh, there is a lot of hype now, uh, the most stable businesses. Okay, so and this is what kind of so people think that unpredictable physical work will, will still remain in the hands of humans, but more predictable uh, or grunge work might be taking over. Now, just you know, to tell you how hard, uh, just taking a, a form of a, a, you know bank form where you fill in your details for application for a new account, just doing a what is called an OCR optical character recognition from it. It's a very hard problem. Nobody has succeeded. Okay, so, uh, but, but the hope is that with these new technologies, at least tasks at that level will become automated. And if you have that, you have many, like ICICI employs so many workers across India whose right? job is just to do the data entry. Those, those things might, might change. Okay, so this is the last part of my talk. And again, I'll switch to the the, the, you know, the, the framework around 2.0 mode. Um, again, I don't think you, I, I have motivated some of this earlier. Uh, in 1.0, we had number strings dictionaries. Here you just have vectors and sets of vectors, and what are called tensors, which are sets of vectors. Here you had you know, the data manipulation algorithm, select and update and aggregate. If then for for loops, here the central entity is a vector dot product. It's just just a weighted sum of W and X. That's the key operator, and that's that's what determines 
you know, if you do the correct sequence of them, set it up, you'll get the desired output from there. Okay, so that's the everything builds upon these dot products. And it, it might feel very strange you know, when you're used to the then as well to fully immerse yourself in a dot product world, but uh, at least this world is like that. And then the networks will build upon the convolution of the current networks, which is trying to capture some aspect of these loops inside the neural network. Yeah, um, again, you can go on the discrete algorithms now. We are, so when you're doing that development, you are very not used at all to think about probabilities. Okay, So a lot of these models are abstracted out from the real world and uh, are good enough for many use cases. But uh, for example, if you have to be planning or you know, traffic uh, traffic planning, it, it's, it's, it's very hard to not take care of the probabilistic uh, units. So, so whether at this time of the day, at this place, the traffic goes, increases this way and decreases. If you capture that effectively, you'll be able to make particular. And for that, you need probability as an essential tool. And, and so, so the outputs here, the, the output layers of 10, they are not zero and ones, they are actually probabilities. Okay? And you try to maximize the probability of the expected output. If you want seven, you want to maximize the probability of that. And then, but at the same time, you have the probabilities of all the other outputs. And you can go along with that way. So you always have these sets of outputs and relations with scores. Focus changes from writing rules and struggling with, you know, maybe putting things down in, a, in the right language to collecting data, cleaning it, labeling it, and creating these examples. So examples. People say we have a lot of data we are collecting from the internet, we have lots of sensors, but those are just the X's, you know, the X and the Y. So you just have lots of X's, but Y's are available very scarce. You have to, in most cases, human beings are involved in labeling, creating these Y's. It's a very task, time consuming thing. There's a lot of ambiguity in one human being can say this is right, and the person is the object here, this, the other one will say there's no object. So again, the, the disciplines around the, the standard, like we have software engineering disciplines for one point of, I don't think that has developed yet, but we need to work on that and develop. And yeah, so this is this is more the data science mode. So earlier sort of, we know the tricky algorithms were maybe already done. Here we are in a more discovery mode where we, we don't know how it will be done. And by several iterations, we get we even get to specify the problem correctly and then solution. Again, I'm, I'm rushing through some of these, but so like I said, dot products are fundamental. So you need to do these matrix multiplications at scale. Now, there are millions of matrices in that investment, uh, or millions of uh, knobs or parameters in there. And to, to do a large scale computation like that, you need specialized processing units, GPUs. Now, NVIDIA has had the GPUs whole market for gamers, for you know even mining bitcoins. And, uh, but as as the industry, even in twenty early twenty, uh, realized that we have to do these efficiently, people started working on NVIDIA machines all, and, uh, to to scale up these operations. And since then, they have become essential. All the cloud providers provide you different kinds of ratio per per minute pricing, yeah, so <coughs> GPUs have become essential mainly because the fundamental units are, are these vectors and transformations. Okay, let me just skip. So again, I think this just repeats what I've been uh, talking. The, when we try to build a system, what are the inputs and outputs of it? How should you prepare data, clean it, transform it, figure out what the right X and Y is, construct features to help your model learn. Features are some transformations of X, X's that we feed into the model to help it learn, but uh, we can talk about what features to let it compute by itself versus what features you provide initially. Now, since this black box, like the top, then you need a reasonable objective. What is the Diff function, when you get an output, how do you diff with the expected? There are many ways of doing it. And what is the right way to do it? 
there are lots of research papers about you know a single problem trying to improve that different function based on the problem context. So that, that's it. Plus metrics, how do you quantify? You're you're trying to search on your e-commerce site, mm -hmm. you uh, you're finding these products, but maybe the, the rank ranking is correct, but is it actually converting to a good business for you? Do you have good conversion ratios? So conversion ratio as a metric versus your ranking as a metric, the two different things you have to connect. And finally, since it's all data-based, the model is heavily biased towards the data it sees. To, in order to make it generalized, meaning that if you throw new data at it, it will still be able to predict correctly. That's a very hard task. And again, part of this whole machine learning uh, framework is, is to learn better ways to do it. How do you train it? How do you set up the network? How do you set up the features so that uh, this will generalize to the other domain that you have not seen? So these are all. <coughs> so I, I guess I'm just quickly blabbering and, and going through different aspects of it. Uh, experimenting is, is 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 a very important part of it. Um, again, since you don't have control over the rules, you can experiment by changing the data, changing what are called hyperparameters of these norms, and even changing the architecture. Of it. And every change that you do can lead to a new result. And in terms of the metrics, and if you have million size data, one change takes a few hours or days. And then you see the metrics not going up. And then you do another experiment. Again, it takes a few days. The metric is maybe slightly going up. How do you figure out? So there's a huge space of experiments that you're looking at. And your brain has the small capacity. So you need tools to help you effectively, na effectively navigate that space of experiment. We are, we are starting to see some of the tools. Uh, you know, again, Google, Buzz, AutoML. Uh, allowing you to automatically navigate through hyperparameters and so on. But that's just one small part of it. You need to for modern, managing these models, keeping track of whether you're growing, you know, you're improving or decreasing, and what parameters was. So we'll see plenty of tools which, uh, which will hopefully be open source and help us navigate this space. And finally, debugging. So debugging is a very fundamental operation in software 1.0. Countless hours spent finding that small bug. Here, the thing in, in 1.0, you can actually pinpoint this the location, this the transformation that I do. Here, since you can't look inside the box, all you can play is with the interface. Inputs out, you can change them, you can change the metric, you can evaluate the metric, you can do multiple experiments. Uh, but finally, you would want to see in some form what is, how do these vectors look like? Or vectors or tensors. And there are ways of visualizing them. And, and seeing if I'm generating one vector is different from another, one tensor is different from another. Again, there are uh, multiple tools needed. Some of them are being developed right now. Okay, so this is the final touch. So this aspect of, of 2.0 program is completely new. Uh, it's about bias. So if the data has bias, the machine also learns. Okay, so, so like, Say forget killer robots bias in the real areas. So we may not be there yet in terms of AGI, but bias is definitely showing up. Uh, maybe if you look at you should you start getting anti-Semitic. Uh, how, how can we avoid those kind of data? I don't have a good answer. Um, I mean, it boils down to looking at it uh, closely and, and figuring out content, essentially inventing metrics that, like you have a search statement, very crude and like you have a search statements to tell the pro for the program to tell you upfront or before it crash tells you that this is the point. Similarly, you can generate a set of metrics that can that can be plugged into these systems and, and tell you upfront. But, but the, I don't think it's a problem that people are talking about, but nobody has a good way of dealing with it. So, uh, yeah, so Google photo mislabels black people as gorillas. <laughs> um, yeah. And there are even more people, you know, you convert these words, you know, want to analyze language, you convert these words into word embeddings. And these word embeddings might contain implicit biases towards 
And when you say a CEO, it actually means it thinks that you are talking about a man versus a woman, because most of the data are, if you take a statistic, CEOs are, are men. So those, those it's, it's very hard to you know, get rid of, well, maybe just being aware of them at least helps, you know, generally ends up being a PR struggle at some point. So before that happens, you should be able to cut over it. And that's one of the reasons people are worried of statistics. Yeah, and this is the final one. Yeah. Again, as I said, there's this whole democratic 2.0 ecosystem around you. There are a bunch of tools. These tools are rapidly evolving per day. Uh, there are people writing blogs about the new version. You know, this change, this improved. You should use this tool now. As there are, you know, camp battles between PyTorch and TensorFlow. Why you should use one tool versus another? So all that is is. But these tools are none of these are mature yet. They are very rapidly growing in terms of. So, so if you know a bit about compilers, you know, there's the hardware. You have the applications at that layer. Applications have to be converted into these efficient matrix um, transformation. And to do the tensor computation uh, very efficiently, there's a whole stack to be developed, which is not there. The earlier stack, the Intel CPU risk stack, is is not suited for, for processing tensor. And this can even lead to new hardware, not just NVIDIA's or AMD's, <coughs> but uh, even newer, you might have a TPUs. There'll be more new TPUs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so summarize. I think I've been blundering for a long time. It's a new scalable paradigm to program computers. And one hope is that we can at least write the human centric applications much better than we used to write earlier. Own challenges you have to work hard on examples, you have to work with GPUs, there's a cost involved here to deal with bias. And thankfully, there is a lot of democratic stuff that is happening. Be aware of. This is a quote from 1960s Lit Lider, this book, which is still applicable. This is probably around the time the first perceptron was, was developed. Uh, yeah, so the idea is that hope is that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly. And there's a in partnership will we'll think it has no human brain. Has. That remains to be the vision now. Uh, the the 2.0 paradigm is, is helping in many ways, trying to make the human work very effectively, very easily with computers, much better than us. Okay, so that is the end of the talk. If you have questions now, I've been blabbing for a while now. Sorry, a little bit louder. What are the unpredictable jobs network for humans? Again, what is AI? You mentioned that unpredictable jobs are network for humans. Yeah, so again, that was a caricature of what people are talking about rather than. Even even composing music, that's what I heard. Yeah. But again, what does composing music mean? Like, like the Jeff Hinton, in the 80s or 90s, the same networks were there. The problem was that they were not working well. And this working well curve is, is a, is a, can be very stretched out. So it took the speech to text technology, the translation technology, got matured <coughs> two years back. Google replaced its translation in it completely. The essential formulation, mathematical formula, even the ideas are at least 10 years old. So getting them to work, getting music, Composition to work as good as you know, you can't distinguish between a human versus computer. I think that's we are not there yet. So, so maybe we'll talk 20 years. I, I can't, can't look that far in the future. Yeah, so I, I think the middle ground, like the Andrew Institute, that it's going to be useful if you can see a lot of use right now. Apply, yeah, go with it. And there, there are a lot of people who are guiding you papers as well as you know, products where the things are going. And one way is to just follow them. What maths one has to you know, learn to get into this? 
Right, so that is a universal question. Uh, since the whole stack, not just the compiler or the computing stack, there's also a math stack there, linear algebra, calculus. Yeah, it's, it's a lifetime to learn all the concepts. So, so the, the pragmatic approach is to start building these systems from you know, looking at some examples, particular use cases, get deep into one problem. And that will teach you, you know, at least, so, so you can go top down. Uh, slowly you'll, you'll feel at some point that I really need to understand back propagation. When you really need to understand, you'll go back to a little bit of different, maybe Khan Academy's differential, uh, differentiation and integration course and get the gist out. And it, that's sufficient to just understand what is back propagation. Similarly, I mean, when you're trying to visualize these vectors and what is going on in transformation, some matrix algebra, so top and probability theory. I mean, it, it, a lot of people try to stay on the edge by reading these papers. The papers are very unfogging. They start out with this terrible notation, p x bar y, and getting intuition of what is going on there is will help. So, but but so, so there are so many things to learn. You can <coughs> the best approach is just go top down and pick. One thing at a time. What's the difference between machine learning and deep learning? Yeah, so the, the initial slide, the, the, again, deep learning, in one line answer, deep learning is an instance of machine learning. Okay, Deep learning mostly around neural networks. Machine learning, there are a number of other black boxes. And plus, shadow networks versus the deep networks. The earlier networks were just one layer, they have 10 layers. Why n layers? Because you can compute abstraction of features. Like you can compute a circle as opposed to edge at the fourth layer. The first layer you just compute the edge. So you let the system compute these more abstract features. And so that reduces effort on the human being plus it's successful. So that's why you're deep learning. So deep learning can be uh, employed for more uh, complex problems. Right. So it depends what you call complex. Like multiple layers, you mentioned it. So, if the uh, application requires multiple layers, then we can apply deep learning. Else, if it is uh, not, then it is machine learning. When do you? So, your question is about when to use machine learning versus when to use deep learning. Yeah. So, again, there are a bunch of thumb rules there, but I don't think they are very precise. One of the things is that if you have a lot of data, uh, you can, it's better to use deep learning uh, because. Uh, since the number of knobs in a deep network are, are there are millions of them, if you take a large amount, and it can easily what is called overfit to your data and, and not capture general data. So that's one reason why people. But again, the there's another thumb rule which says that if you, there's anything related to text, images, speech, you're better off using deep learning. So that, that's a huge domain. Uh, yeah. But on what basis we come up with human centrics? Because we can consider our Twitter was a human as well as Buddha was also a human. Again, the day philosophy can have whoever designs this one according to their profitability and whatever their need, this AI will be designed. Okay. Wherein, like, it will not be an equal thing which we are going to do for the society. Self-driven cars, we can accept it. That it is going to drive us whatever, wherever we want. But we should think that the opposite party or the opposite driver who is going to come against us should also be in self-driven car, which is applied with all the analytics that is going to take. Right. But in so, India, we have a lot of... Right. So, so one more slide there which was missing was ethics. Now, ethics is one of the objectives of humanity. We have been trained to follow some ethics, and some people follow it to greater degree, less degree. Now, ethics translates as these objective functions for the AI. You know, how, whether I'll, I'll, I won't care with pedestrian, I'm, I'm tramping it, I'm, I'm going forward, versus I'm actually caring too much about it and letting me have the whole thing. So, so the objectives have to be very carefully set up so that. <laughs> This ethics is captured. And how to do that is, is a very hard part. 
And the main thing with 1.0 and 2.0 is that as he has put it, like uh, this is like we talk about farming. So you plant a seed, you grow a tree, right. you get a, a fruit and then you give it to somebody. Yeah. Whereas like this AI can be used like whether to verify whether it is a mango or apple. That's it. As per whatever the thing or exploration that we have got or implementations what we got in this market. So that is the only thing we can use, but we cannot make an AI to go plant and grow a tree and get it. That is also a big problem which in future. So, so I would just you know, try to uh, try to come into technical wise. No, no, I, I'm missing the word. Uh, I'll be more careful about making those statements because, you know, AI is not just about detecting the object, it has in the current state, it, it has gone much higher. Okay, but, but, you know, whether it's able to do farming for you completely, those are open questions. And it, it, I think it's, it's wrong to try to answer them, you know, with conviction at this point. You can have probabilistic guess and maybe you can have arguments over, that's fine. But saying that or trying to, you know, uh, trying to uh, make a, a hype or a propaganda is is not right. So, the, do you get my point? Yeah. There's a middle ground there. I think we should just stick to it. I have seen is like this Google search as whatever the AI that has been implemented, right. just bluntly taking up with whatever the major searches that is happening. So, for example, you told you should be, or uh, you go to how to. So, it will be giving an uh, one suggestion stating that how to. Case or how to so I think you are yeah only reiterating the, the same problems. Minus yeah, so we, we need to be careful about how we train these systems, and bias and ethics are very important issues. And people will since they have started recognizing it, they'll they'll be able to address it to some extent. You know, one one example that we use is computer security. You know, people who have built computers, security firewalls, almost all of them believe that they can be there's some way to break. Okay, and in spite of that, there are so many the whole world banking systems, everything is running on these computers. So, so they have been cautious about a more defensive approach to to things which are not completely known. So, for sec security, is it, that's what the world has adopted. So similarly, when it comes to ethics and bias, I think people are aware of it, and they'll figure out some way to at least be defensive about it if, if they can't fully govern or control where it is going. Again, ethics or uh, governance board should be implemented. Yeah, so so all everybody is going to be involved. If if two point zero has to prosper, from from individual developers to government, everybody will get involved and it's getting involved. Any more? So what are the tools involved to uh, handle this neural network deep learning? Like TensorFlow, all those things can be used. Yeah, so TensorFlow is one of the very popular tools to build the programs with neural networks. PyTorch is another MXNet. There are a bunch of tools, there. but TensorFlow and PyTorch, I think, are the most popular ones. So, for any use case, can they blindly go through neural network approach? Uh, so, let's say I need so to let me just. I need to create a chatbot. Right. Some kind of system. Yeah, so, so, general understanding is that for if you want to understand text, images, and speech, your programs are about them. Instead of what's the other approach, you start writing rules about it. You now, my chatbot got this message. This is talking about mobile, so maybe I should look up the model. Those are sort of rules. Instead of doing it in a purely rule-driven way, you you switch to the you know, this vector-driven world. Think of words as vectors and do transformations on top of them. And eventually, I mean, there might be parts which are which you can't do it well right now by 2.0. You go back to you know, writing rules for it. But, but there's a lot of neural networks are remarkably good at understanding sentences even now. So you can you can get a boost in your application by just starting off with them. It's very hard to give you generic rules. So like, there are solutions which use 